the Sam Hills going on here? The Rewatch Podcast presents the Lois and Clark Rewatch. Dedicated to the series Lois and Clark, the new adventures of Superman on ABC. Join us each week as we investigate the origins of the Man of Steel and uncover crime in Metropolis. Send your feedback to the Rewatch Podcast at gmail.com. Join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash rewatchpodcast or follow us on Twitter at rewatchpod. Oh, hey, 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 let's get back to it. And welcome back to the Rewatch Podcast and our Lovers and Clark Rewatch. I'm Corey. And I'm a nerd too. I just found that out tonight. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us than there are of you. I know there's alumni here tonight. When you went to Adams, you might have been called a spaz, a dork, or a geek. Any of you that have ever felt stepped on, left out, picked on, put down, whether you think you're a nerd or not, why don't you just come down here and join us? Okay? Come on. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, ex- I'll I'll explain that if in, if anyone doesn't understand that we'll get to that. <laughs> yes, but uh, first, thank you for joining us, everyone. <laughs> uh, we're here discussing two more episodes of Lois and Clark, and this week's headline reads: "Home is on Sunday," and we're discussing "Home is where the hurt is," and "Never on Sunday." But uh, before we get into our discussions, a quick follow up. Yeah. So my quote there, for those of you who do not know, is from Revenge of the Nerds, and I. I chose that because in this episode this first uh first episode we're going to talk about we have one of the guest stars is from revenge of the nerds did you know that no i didn't i haven't uh, seen the revenge of the nerds movies oh come on that's like that's a classic staple of the 80s there probably something i should chuck on my uh to watch list yeah Exactly. Porky's Revenge of the Nerds, that, there's a whole series of them that came out back then. Gratuitous nudity and, and whatnot in those films. But yeah, the, the uh, handyman is, is the lead nerd from, the, uh, from that uh, whole series. I was like, since he was in this episode, I was like, well, let me go ahead and pull a quote from you know, one of the things that he said there. It's kind of neat because while I was looking up stuff for him, I found that there's a character in the Revenge of the Nerds series called Stan Gables. Stan Gables also happens to be the name of the guy who had that flesh disease back when they were resurrecting dead criminals. Mm -hmm. Remember that episode? Yeah. So that was his name. His name was Stanley Gables. And I was like, oh, that's a neat tie-in. And then also in that episode, we had Albie, his assistant, who was actually played, he's the guy who actually played Booger in Revenge of the Nerds. that's right. So we got like a little, (laughs) we got a whole little Revenge of the Nerds reference thing here. I don't know if they did that like on purpose for Stanley Gables. I mean, it's just a normal name, but still it seems kind of interesting that they had the guy who played Booger in there and then they had a guy who is named after one of the other characters in Revenge of the Nerds. So I thought that was kind of it was kind of neat. Interesting little tie, and it's it's weird how these little connections come up here and there, isn't it? Yeah, I didn't I didn't see it back then because I wasn't really looking up Revenge of the Nerds. I just knew Booger, you know, and I knew yeah I wasn't going to use one of his quotes for that, so I didn't find out back then. But looking up the stuff for this one is when I was like, oh look at that neat little. Good little coincidence there. All right, well, let's get into the first episode discussion today. Uh, the episode is titled Home is Where the Hurt Is, written by Eugenie Ross Lemming and Brad Buckner, directed by Jeffrey Nuttage, and this originally aired on December 17th of 1995. Clark. Lois, where have you been? I stayed late to finish the Mindy story. Why would somebody want to kill her? Revenge? Try and keep her from something she wants. Thanks for grabbing that phone, by the way. Mm. It's with all the takeout. You invited my parents and me over for dinner. I guess you forgot. Oh, Clark, I'm sorry. Jonathan, Martha, uh, Lois. Oh, you didn't uh, tell me they were here already. Oh, I'm so Lois? sorry. I forgot all about dinner. Oh, no oh, big deal. Uh, Lois, listen, there's something. Oh, you excuse know me, Martha. You... Clark, could you get the napkins? They're down in that drawer there. Uh, Lois. Well, Clark was out. Uh, he... uh, 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 Lois. Uh... Surprise! Mother! Lois. Oh, boy. Oh, I couldn't stand the thought of you alone and miserable in this wretched city at Christmas. <laughs> Actually, I pictured you more alone than this. Uh, well, uh, yes, I, uh, Mother, this is Clark. Lois, could I talk to you for just a minute? And these are Clark's parents. Uh, Lois? Surprise! Princess! Daddy? Ellen? Sam? Oh, boy. 
Martha, were you trying to tell me something? Your father's here. Christmas time is here again, and that means family coming into town. And not just Ma and Pa Ken, but Lois's divorced mom and dad as well, toting along his robotic girlfriend, Baby Gunderson. However, Lois is not the only one disappointed with family members, as Mindy Church is feeling the absence of her framed and incarcerated husband, Bill Church, as she makes her ploy to take over Inner Gang, eventually killing all the current heads of crime within the organization when they balk at her wanting to be the leader. With help from a criminal named Handyman, they manage to extract a virus from Superman's stolen spaceship and use it to essentially get the Man of Steel sick, hoping that it will end up killing him. Lois, with her mother Ellen forcefully tagging along, goes to meet a contact, but they arrive to find her dead with a man nearby mistaking Lois and her mother for hookers, telling them they are supposed to stay off of these streets. Later, Ellen and Ma Kent get mugged while shopping, and after attempting to chase down the mugger, sees him getting kidnapped by the same creepy man from earlier. Meanwhile, Superman, and Clark of course, starts to show signs of severe sickness, and the only solution that Sam Lane can find is to use kryptonite to bring the hero to near death, starving out the virus, and then hoping to be able to bring him back to life after. Lois and Clark's articles on the new possible organized crime in Metropolis is published, leading Mindy to realize that this is a problem, so she orders the handyman to find a way to kill them, which he does by rigging their microwaves to cause a stroke-like death. As Sam's treatment shows signs of working and Superman awakens from his near-death experience, Lois starts to head over to see him while Ma can't warms up some coffee in the microwave. As the microwave starts to emit its rigged death sound, Superman, now restored to full health, hears the sound and speeds over to save Lois and his parents from the assassination attempt. The handyman, waiting for Mindy Church to arrive in her office for a meeting, finds that he has been set up for refusing her sexual advances as her office now appears to be his, including personal pictures, stationery, and voicemails, giving the police a solid case to arrest him while Mindy Church is free to continue her reign on crime. My boy is sick for the first time in his life. Martha, does he have any medical records or x-rays? Anything that shows how his body works? No, nothing. There was just never any need. Ah, we got here as quick as we could. Now, what's going on? Daddy, hmm? you're a doctor. Ah, thank you for remembering, sweetie. I was wondering if you could look at a friend of mine. Ah. Hello, uh, Superman? Uh, well, he and Clark are very close. And Clark's out on assignment, so when Superman got sick, I brought him here. Daddy, we need your help. I need your help. Oh, he's very ill. His physiology may be totally different from ours. I haven't practiced for 15 years. I know. Uh, but Daddy, when I was a little girl, I knew that my father was a brilliant doctor. Wasn't he? If I never ask anything of you, to be that doctor again. All right, so just a little bit in the uh, investigation. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, so uh, what I reactions found was that there was an alternate scene where Handyman shows Mindy the virus. So we had the one in the actual episode, and then we had this one where it was going to start out with him on the phone talking to his wife. I think in the show he was talking to his daughter. So in this one he was talking to his wife, and he was saying, yes, I'll pick up you know milk and bread or whatever on the way home. Just make sure, you know whatever his daughter's name was, make sure she does her homework. Um, and then Mindy later... When she she comes in and she references the daughter's name while they're talking, and then he tells you know he says, oh yeah, you know it's tough, you know being a husband and father, you got to leave your work at work, you know like your criminal work at work, um, and then uh, she comes on to him just like she does in the uh, in the show. She starts rubbing his chest and he just pushes her away. So it's it's very similar to what went on, but uh, just a slight little tiny differences. Not sure why they made the adjustments. And then there was supposed to be a little scene right before. Lois comes in, she says, you know, I filed that story on Mindy Church's suicide right before that, before she comes into Perry's office. Jimmy was supposed to be in there with Perry, and he was like, giving instructions to Perry on how to use the ski, the, the skis that he was on. And Jimmy's like, you know, I t keep telling you, Chief, you got to bend your knees, bend your knees just at the right time. And Perry gets, of course, mad. And he's like, if you tell me to bend my knees again, I'll bend yours permanently. And that's the that's when Lois <laughs> comes in right there. Random. So, there you go. Yeah, okay. Well, not much there, really. No, nah, not too much. <laughs> Maybe next year at this time, we'll be spending the holidays at our house. 
Hmm. I guess there's a lot to be said for family. People who stick by you no matter what. Just like you stuck by me. Plus, I have never been through anything like that. Maybe it was the kryptonite that saved me, but I think it was you. seem kind of dull. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're well, getting into the main story and the lead here, Virus Villainy. Yes. Dun, dun, dun. And I was right. And my guess, Christmas episode. Yep, <laughs> you were. I love when I get things right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's Christmas in Metropolis and Mindy is back. And I think we kind of thought that maybe Mindy would be in the next episode when we were talking about that, right? Right. It turns out she's here in the Christmas episode. So we were like, sort of, right, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but she's busy rebuilding into gang and starting by poisoning all the mob bosses who aren't on board with her nefarious plan. Mm-hmm. And this is a, a bit of a cliched, over-the-top, mega-boss way of just killing everyone. Let's just gas everyone. Exactly. Kind of, kind of made me thought, think of like a, like an Austin Powers or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so <Exactly>. evil. <laughs> Someone makes a, a creative attempt on Mindy's life, and that flair for the dramatic leads her to Joey, or a.k.a. the handyman. <laughs> The handyman. Now, this whole thing about, like, he had a clown with a bomb tied to a helium balloon, like, it was weird. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was definitely a little strange. <laughs> and though it, I had to actually go back because I wasn't sure how that tied in at first. So I was like, oh, okay, I get, I get who he is. So, yeah, I get it now. But, yeah, at first I was like, what the heck's up with that? Yeah, it's just a weird setup for this guy who's an assassin, but he always has this flair for the dramatic. I'd go with it, mm -hmm. I guess. It's fine. Yeah. So she knows it was him. She tracks him down. She actually hires him to assassinate Superman by creating a virus using bacteria that is on his spaceship that he came to Earth in. Now, right. interesting idea. This is, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to make of this. Like, did Mindy come up with this or what? Well, yeah, I think she's, I mean... Uh, she she plays the part of like you know dumb, but she's very it seems like she's very smart. I think yeah, she may have come up with the idea. She didn't explain uh, how they stole it or how they even knew about Superman's spaceship, but somehow they you know they got a tip or something. So I don't know. I think she's just she's smarter than she lets on, of course. Well, last we knew, the spaceship was in the hands of Bureau thirty thirty nine. Right. right. Mm -hmm. That's the last time we saw yeah, it. Yeah, so obviously she has some connections. Now she's the head of Intergang. But uh, yeah, so that's the plan, and it seems like a pretty reasonable plan, I guess. She just expects that uh, the handyman knows how to cultivate a virus, which it turns exactly. out he does, so that's lucky. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, in the meantime, Lois and Clark get this tip on all this like crime that's going on. Like crime seems to have spiked because yes. and it's, uh, it's like an intergang plan, right? Like Mindy's orchestrating all this. So they get this tip from an informant called Long Legs Lulu. <laughs> <laughs> And Lois goes to investigate this further, right? And her mother tags along. And uh, we'll get into the reasons why her mother is there in the bylines, I think, really. Not really mm. part of the main story so much, so. No. Nope. But her mother's there. And <laughs> they find her dead body upside down in a dumpster with the long legs <laughs> hanging out. <laughs> I know. I don't know why. I just thought it was a funny little sight gag. Oh, no. It's very funny. When I saw it, I was like, oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the way they were positioned and everything. I'm like, oh, all right. Uh, so weird. And then the whole thing with her mother being threatened by that guy who, like, mistakes her for a hooker or something. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> This is what, this is, all right, fine. If that's what you go for, hey, there's someone for everyone. <laughs> I wouldn't look at her and think, oh, there's a hooker, <laughs> you know? But I guess maybe times are tough, you know? I don't know. These days you go to any old website, you get that little pop-up that says, like, 
50-year-old women in your neighborhood need sex too. <laughs> exactly. And he's like, uh, exactly. no, I'm not going to click on that. <laughs> but Superman tries to, quote-unquote, save Mindy from jumping off this billboard. And it's all just a big ruse, of course, to like throw this virus in his face. This was really weird. Because they're up on this billboard and it's for like a nasal spray or something. And I'm like, yes. what is up with this billboard? And then when they revealed like they were going to put the virus into the spray thing. And I was like, that's a really convoluted way to infect him with this virus. Well, yeah. And just like you have to be lucky enough to have an advertisement like that nearby. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I guess it could have been uh, they could have done it anyway. It's just I guess they thought that would be cool to have it just, you know, come out through the the spray of the nose nose spray on the advertisement. But, I mean, I guess they could have just, like, sprayed it into the general air around him. You know, he would have known about it then. But still, even if he knew about it, it still would have infected him. You know what I mean? Mm. It's like, even if he knew, like, if you just sprayed it right in his face, you know, he'd know that you did something, but <laughs> he wouldn't know at first what was going on. Then when he got sick, he'd be like, oh, it's because they sprayed me. So either way, I mean, it was, it was convoluted. It, it didn't really matter in the end, because no matter what, you're going to infect him easily. Mm -hmm. And we've seen Superman be infected before, that time when he kissed that reporter lady played by Raquel Welch. Oh, yeah, yeah that's right. kissed him with the kryptonite lipstick on, and he got all mm -hmm. that kryptonite. So, like, they can't do that again, like like some sort of physical contact in order to infect him. So yeah, this is as good a means as any, I guess. Right. And it does help Mindy sort of play up this uh, facade that she is still this ditzy blonde who really just misses her husband and <laughs> mm -hmm. she's having this whole thing about giving presents away to orphans and even though clark and uh, superman is feeling sick he still sort of shows up there you know it's like a yearly thing now like a tradition that's come around he brings presents to the orphans and mindy's actually even talked her way into like being introduced by superman so like her facade on the outside, she looks like a really good person. Like, she's done well yeah. with this. She's even got Superman as a spokesperson for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I was first, again, at first, I'm. this episode was like, it was okay. But I, I just found myself, like, just not, like, being drawn into the story as much as I... I remember this episode from back in the day. And I, I remember liking it. But watching it again, I'm kind of like, I don't know, my attention, like, drifted many times while watching this episode <laughs> and so when she showed up i was like wait why is she there what wait what's she doing what why is she dressed okay let me go back and see what's going on here so yeah it, it took me a couple tries to get through the to understand everything that was going on like the clown thing and then this thing i'm like oh okay i see i get it now it couldn't hold my attention for some reason but did you notice that it's not like she even like bought presents for the orphans like everything she was given away was like household items like toasters and potato mashes and stuff oh, was... i don't know it was really weird <laughs> like she just raided her kitchen and put bows on everything there you go christmas presents yeah <laughs> that's pretty good but yeah with with clark and well superman being out for the count, really. Lois takes this chance to reconnect with her father. Mm -hmm. Now, her, her mother and father, are they played by the same people they were before? <laughs> no. I didn't think so. I'm trying to think. I'm like, I know the mother's <laughs> definitely different, but I couldn't remember the father. Because the, the first mother that we had was uh, the original Lois Lane we talked about a couple episodes oh, right. ago. right. Yep, yep, yep. That was Phyllis Coates. And then now we have this person who plays uh, a different... The father was from the uh, episode with um, the cyborgs mm -hmm. in the first season with uh, the fighters who were like getting pumped up with extra parts of their body that's right that was the whole storyline yeah. for that wasn't it Ugh. so that's yeah that was the original father and he was kind of shorter and had uh, like brown th still thin hair but brown hair and this guy's totally different much thinner much taller you know a different totally different personality mm -hmm. so keeping the same backstory still he you know was a doctor and tinkers around with robotics of course but Yep, different actors. But I thought it was good for the episode because, like, they bring him in and they sort of, I guess, reintroduce him. But he's, like, selling schlock on the TV and, you know, he's really yes. had a big downfall <laughs> as a oh, respected yeah. doctor or surgeon. Yes. And she has to, like, turn to her father and say, like, Look, Superman is really, really sick here and I need you to be a doctor, please. Mm -hmm. And he comes up with this plan to pretty much kill Superman. Like, we just need to really just take him out and the virus will starve out. That should cure him. 
So yeah. they get a big chunk of kryptonite from Dr. Klein. And, oh man, I have to say, this is the best part of the episode. They have this <laughs> completely heartbreaking goodbye as Superman falls into mm. a coma. I loved this scene. Yes. I thought it was so good. Yeah, that was a good scene. Definitely. You know, very touching. I'm kind of wondering. Now this, uh, like I said, I read a lot of, uh, a, a handful of other reviews for each episode just to see what other people were thinking. Because it's good to see what other people thought. And I think it was the Superman homepage that brought this up. And I didn't think about it until now, but they have Lois's father there. And the whole point of this is to try to bring back together Lois's relationship with her father. And, well, with her mother to some extent also, but more about her father. You know, because her father's been off for so long. So that's why they have him there doing this whole thing with Superman. But realistically, wouldn't Superman have gone to Star Labs and Dr. Klein to take care of this problem? Mm -hmm. Rather than a doctor who has no experience with super with Superman at all, you know, and his physiology. You know, and they just try this. I mean, it's pretty much an old-fashioned way of trying to, you know, beat this virus, this, this, this sickness that he has. Whereas if they had went to Star Labs, they have all the technology and they could have you know, tried other things. I mean, obviously it works, but I'm just thinking like continuity wise, we should have stuck with Dr. Klein. Like we mentioned him, we don't ever see him. You know, you'd think Dr. Klein would be like, well, why don't you bring him to Star Labs? <laughs> you know, why are you trying to treat him here? with, you know, old-fashioned remedies or whatever. Yeah, that was a little bit unusual because they do go mm -hmm. to Dr. Klein to get the kryptonite. He's never actually on screen, though. It's like they phone him up and Lois says, Dr. Klein, I'm going to put Superman on so you can get voice notification. <laughs> and then Superman's just like, right. yes, please, release it to them. <laughs> and then, bang, they've got kryptonite. <laughs> and I was like, okay, fair enough. Yes. <laughs> but I get where they're exactly. going. They need this yeah. connection between Lois and her father. He needs to become a redeemed character. So after a long wait, of course, Superman is cured. <laughs> it works. And it's quite nice, too, because like Lois, even though she's across town in her own apartment, she feels it. She knows it. So it's, mm -hmm. again, it's, it, it builds that relationship between Lois and Clark, which I really like. Yeah, I like this. Yeah, a little connection between them. Call me a sap. Do whatever you want. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. We're not judging you. <laughs> but, of course, before they can rush back to him, Joey the Handyman has rigged up the microwave. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Here we go. Crazy plan. The microwave will emit a sound that will induce a stroke. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stroke-like symptoms, yes. Now, the fact that there's three people in the room and all three of them had a stroke, I mean, that would be a bit unbelievable. <laughs> a I, I think somebody would figure it out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, of course, it's like just in time. So if the man has come around, he knows... This is going on, and he rushes over there and throws the microwave up into space, mm -hmm. saving Lois and his parents from uh, an, in yes. an inevitable death. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> they track Joey to the underground office underneath the Cosmo. Yeah, this was good. <laughs> That's right, because remember, we had that episode where they said there's a whole bunker underneath the Cosmart, you know? It's got intergang written all over the walls as well. Which I <laughs> exactly. <was> intergang was here. <laughs> Spray painted over there on the bathroom wall or something. And Joey finds that Mindy's just set him up. Like, <laughs> made yep. the whole place look like it's like his office and stuff. I know. Man, I was laughing my butt off. I thought it was really funny. He, like, yeah. get a phone call <laughs> and the answer machine message comes on. I know. Oh, I thought that was so funny. <laughs> I was like, man. Man, and like, all right, so we get, I mean, he is a bad guy. He is a villain, obviously. He has a whole family. Like, that's, that's the whole thing. He has like a, an actual family that probably doesn't know anything about mm -hmm. his criminal activities. So it's kind of sad. It's like, oh, sorry, man. You <laughs> just lost, you know, and <laughs> no more father for you, little girl. And, you know, I guess you better get a job, wifey, you know. <laughs> It's like heartbreaking. I'm like, sorry, <laughs> he's going away for a long time now. Exactly. You just got to take solace in the fact that this man is an assassin at the end of the day. Exactly. <laughs> he's probably killed a lot of people. So. <laughs> yeah, it's like that one conversation he had. He's like on the phone talking to his daughter. He's like, well, remember, you can watch TV, but none of that gratuitous violence. And then he goes and shoots like a, a dummy off to the side yeah. with a laser or something. But I don't know. All in all... It was, I thought it was a, a, a decent episode for a Christmas episode, you know? Yeah. I can't expect too much. It's not like this was like the best episode ever, but I, I, kind, of, I kind of enjoyed it. As far as like a Christmas episode goes, it was okay. I mean, there was that one touching moment 
you know, between the two of them before he slips off into the coma. But it just didn't feel very Christmassy to me, even with, you know, Mindy dressed up as Miss Santa or whatever. It was it just didn't feel very Christmassy. Like the other, the uh, the one with the shots, you know, with the toy man. That felt very, uh, very Christmassy to me. This one was like, eh, it's all right. Well, let's get into some bylines. The episode opens with this fanfare and the superman s up in the stars yeah i forgot about that that they did that and i i was like oh yeah i remember that i like that i didn't originally put this in the bylines but they do it for the next episode as well and i'm like is this gonna become a regular thing now i believe it does because when it came up i was i was like oh yeah that's right i forgot all about that because yeah i remember it yeah it's just uh, strange that just randomly they've started doing this (laughs) i know weird okay so lois's dad has like gone off the rails <laughs> and he's selling abs in a bottle on tv and stuff like that and, and then he shows up at lois's place with a, 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 ostensibly a sex doll <laughs> baby gunderson weird baby gunderson why not give it a better name than that <laughs> first of all baby gunderson i mean gunderson just makes me think of like an old man you know like gunderson get in here you know that type of thing um <laughs> I don't know. It was interesting. I mean, I, it's consistent with the character because he does mess around with robotics. So, okay, why not? You know, but yeah, it is weird that he, he brings her along. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, yeah, don't worry. She's not human. You can treat her however you want. I don't know. It's just something like when you really, really think about it, like really think creepy. about it, it's creeping <laughs> gross. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Perry is also in a pretty bad spot for holidays. His son has invited him to go skiing, but it turns out that Alice is also going to be there. So it's kind of like a, the same thing that's going on with Lois. Like both of her parents have shown up at her place. And this is kind of like new for Perry, I guess. Like he was, I guess, like it seemed like he was excited to be spending holidays with his sons, but oh, now Alice right. is going to be there. Well, this is the first time I think we've heard mention of the son, right? I don't know. I think he's mentioned like having kids before. Before, but I don't think specifically a son. Yeah. I couldn't remember if he had actually mentioned uh, having, you know, kids or a son before. I thought, oh, well, this is the first time. Because I know that uh, his son does show up in a future episode at some ah, point. I remember that happening. Cool. Yeah. But yeah, and it was nice to just sort of have some Perry stuff, especially him like practicing skiing up on the table. Why he had to be on the yeah. table <laughs> to practice the skiing, I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But it was a bit of background noise that was, yeah added something to the episode, I guess. Uh, And then lastly, Martha and Ellen are mugged and they follow the guy and it's the same guy who threatened Ellen in the alley. Yes. Now, I don't know why they would follow him. Is this just, is this supposed to be sort of advancing the Martha character a bit more? Like maybe she's got that fearless streak and that's you know what was passed on to clark or something like that like that's where he gets that fearless streak from i don't know it was just a bit odd yeah i think she's just i think they're trying to show that she's just not someone like like ellen would just let it go because like oh well i got mugged you know but they're showing that martha's yeah more of a go-getter and believes in justice and things like that so you know they follow and that's where she gets the information about the um van remember she memorizes the uh, Mm. license plate and, like, that's another thing that from the main episode when we were watching, you know, like, they they come in and Ellen tells uh, Lois's father, Sam, that they were mugged. You know, he's like, oh, my God. Da, da, da. And then they get a phone call. And Lois is like, guess who owns that van? And I'm like, wait a second. How did, what do you mean? Who? How did you figure out? Like, she just, they just told you just now they were mugged. But then when when they come in, there's a throwaway line where they say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm glad you got the license plate mom but you shouldn't be chasing after muggers because that's another thing i was like did i drift off again yeah it was it all just seemed very convenient really that ellen would run into that guy in the alley i mean that guy's standing there with a gun and there's a dead hooker in the garbage (laughs) behind you right and then this guy mugs you and that guy immediately runs to the guy who was threatening you with the gun before and stuff and it was all just like yeah it's a bit convenient yeah well they're just trying to show that you know you can't commit crime in metropolis unless you're part of the whole inner gang circle i guess you're right you know because like he was just some guy who said oh i'm gonna mug these two old ladies you know and then found out well no you can't do that unless you're part of our organization that was another reason for that you know having that whole scene all right well let's get into this week's quote vote shall we all right what's everybody standing around for this a newspaper not happy hour at buckingham palace what are we here? The Daily Planet? Or second stringers from the Weehawken Gazette? Oh, oh, am I making myself perfectly clear? 
a few votes this week. Clear winner, but uh, just a, a warning up front, folks. This one's going to get a little bit weird, I think. <laughs> Mostly because it's about the sex doll. And the fact that we're both dudes and all the impressions that we do are all guy voices as well. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's going to get weird. But uh, okay. <laughs> let's do it. Cue the music. Mr. Movie Voice enters the room. I'd like you to meet my fiance, Mr. Movie Voice. My God, he's nine years old. I am speechless. Hello, uh, movie. Gee, you must be cold. I do not feel the cold. Eggnog. I do not drink. Uh, don't think of him as a human being. Sir, that's a little bit Paz. Well, I made him. Excuse me? Built him. You, you remember I used to tinker around with cyborgs? Mr. Movie Voice is an improvement. 100% machine. Of all the sicko, psycho, sexual, nothing personal, Mr. Movie Voice. Oh, for the love of Mike! Yay! And see. <laughs> that was a lot of characters. That was weird. <laughs> yeah. I really do need to pay attention when I'm picking out ones that could be up for the quote vote and mm -hmm. maybe not pick a scene that has six different people in it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the first time we've done that with that many characters. I know. There was a couple of characters there. I'm just like, oh, let's just give that line to this other person. <laughs> <'Cause> right. <laughs> can't put too many impressions in there. That's going to be difficult. All right, well, let's get into the second episode discussion today. And the episode is titled Never on Sunday. Written by Grant Rosenberg. Directed by Michael Lang. You reckon Lang or Lange? Yeah, I said Lang. Lang. And this originally aired on January 7th. Happy New Year of 1996. <laughs> yes, we've made it. <laughs> Jimmy, are you okay? You got a bump on your head. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess I was trying to hide underneath my desk and I hit my head. That desk was in your imagination, son. Thanks. Jimmy was so convinced of what he was experiencing, his body reacted as if his vision were real. It's a pretty interesting trick. <laughs> no trick. I only made use of what was already in his mind. You're a... Pisces, right? Good guess, yeah. February 28th. 1965? Close. 66. Oh. You're not planning on sending him back to second grade? No. <laughs> I'd have something much more interesting for a man as worldly as Mr. Kent. We should get going. Bye-bye. So bear on. You got Mr. Kent's handkerchief. <laughs> mm -hmm. Clark, suffering from a sleepless night due to a nightmare seemingly brought upon him through dark voodoo magic, finds himself even further stressed as Lois's mother takes over wedding preparations and has plans to make it an extravagant affair, whereas he would prefer something smaller and intimate. Having received an invitation to see Baron Sunday, a touring magician, he decides to attend with Lois, though he swore he threw the invitation away. Meanwhile, a shuttle driver has a brief interaction with the Baron and shortly after that freaks out and sees images of himself from his time in the army and believes he is under attack by enemy forces and drives wildly through Metropolis before finally dying from an apparent heart attack, an image of a snake appearing and then disappearing on his chest. When Lois and Clark investigate the man, they find a connection to an old NIA friend of Clark's, Matt Young, from his early reporting days. Within minutes, Matt suffers from a hallucination of dogs attacking him, and he has a heart attack as well, but luckily, Clark is able to make use of his vulnerability to harness electricity and start his heart back up again. Jimmy manages to find another link between the three men, a man named John Hendricks, otherwise known as Baron Sunday. It turns out that Matt fed the 
young Clark false information which framed Hendricks for a crime he didn't commit, and now he has come looking for the men involved to get his revenge. Clark consults with Star, who reveals that this is very dark magic, and to escape the nightmare visions he has been having, he must have a talisman that is greater than the evil, something based on great love. When Lois and Clark go to confront Sunday, Lois slips her engagement ring into Clark's pocket. An altercation occurs in which Sunday gets the best of Clark, pushing him off the plane as it takes off and escapes with Lois. Clark is frantic on the ground, victim to his fearful visions, but he spies the engagement ring and it brings him back to Earth, letting him fight through his fear to reveal that it wasn't actually a nightmare, but rather him remembering his Kryptonian parents, putting him into the ship to send him away from the dying Krypton. He flies off and rescues Lois and stops the plane while the police arrive to arrest Baron Sunday, only he is nowhere to be found as a snake sneaks away from the plane silently. Clark, I thought I lost you. Oh, you're not getting rid of me that easy. Well, I saw that snake on your chest and I thought... The snake? Like the others? It was there. I saw it. Well, it's gone now. Everything's fine. Everything is not fine. You've got to tell me what's going on. I've been having these weird experiences. Experiences? Well, maybe not experiences. More like visions. Like the other men? Before their heart stops? Clark, why didn't you tell me? Well, because I didn't connect it to the others until now. I, I thought it would just go away. Lois, I've never really been scared. Not like this. What did you say? It's like I was being buried alive. In some kind of coffin. Look, I'm not giving in to this. Oh, see, this is what you do. Your whole life is about not showing fear. You just push it right out of your head. But this fear is a part of you. Something so terrible happened that you pushed it way down, and now you've got to let it out, or it could... Scare me to death. Like the others. Now, what links you to them? You only know one of them. Yeah, Matt Young. Tell me what happened in Jamaica. All right, so just a little bit more in the investigation on this one, but not too much. It's still a bit light this week. Well, in the script, when Clark leaves Lois in the very beginning, Lois is supposed to be, you know, understanding, you know, like she does, you know, when she sees that he's using his super hearing, she knows something's up, so she has to cover for him, and she's all fine with that. That's what it said in the script. But in the actual episode, if you, if you watch Terry, I reaction is no, that she actually looks surprised. You know, like not angry, you know, but just surprised that he suddenly had to go. I suppose that look is because they're talking about these wedding preparations and things like that. And she's, of course, as the, as the episode goes on, she's worried that maybe he doesn't want to get married. So she's the way it's acted, which was a good choice, you know, makes it think that she's not really seeing that he's using his superhero. Maybe she's thinking he's just trying to get away for a moment. Yeah, interesting. So there was a line missing uh, when Lois asks if uh, he knew the victims, Baron Sunday, and he says he doesn't uh, involve himself with humans. He merely flies above them. Hmm. Which so kind of goes, like, you know, remember how he said earlier in the episode, he's like, you know, flying is like freedom. You know, I love the fly. So it's just it's just reinforcing that whole, you know, thing that he likes. Not really needed. Yeah. When uh, they go to tell Baron that uh, Ziggy is dead, he was supposed to say, well, he was a faithful servant. He never complained and he didn't drink much. You know, he didn't have much to say about him besides <laughs> that. It's another throwaway line. Well, in the episode, he doesn't even really react to the news that Ziggy's dead. <laughs> right, he didn't say anything. I think it's better that, that he didn't say anything. It makes it seem more like he knows. Yeah. You know, it's like, of course, he's dead. I killed him. <laughs> yeah. There was another line that they cut out that the, the Baron was supposed to say when they're taking off in the uh, plane at the very end, and he has Lois. His original plan was to throw her out over the ocean. You know, once they got over the ocean, just toss her out the uh, the door. So a little more cruel. Mm. And then finally, uh, Clark, when he uh, gets pushed off of the plane and he's on the ground at the uh, airport, he was supposed to have ripped off his uh, shirt and suit to, you know, so he was wearing the Superman outfit when he sees the ring on the ground there. So he was already changed into Superman at the, uh, the end of that. Mm. Okay. Nothing big. Yeah. You know, <laughs> just minor little changes, I guess. Fair enough. <laughs> Jimmy says that John Hendricks definitely does not have a brother. Well, okay. If we're in the world of the walking dead, my vote is that John Hendricks and Baron Sunday are the same person. That's pretty much where I went. 
Matt Young and Rod Clemens were both in the NIA. Hendricks and I are connected to Young through that incident in Jamaica. But Hendricks's background check was clean. Which means that I helped frame an innocent man. It makes sense, doesn't it? <sighs> Young and Clemens were probably running those guns in Jamaica, and Hendricks was just some pilot that they hired. When the whole thing went sour, Young fed information. To a very green reporter. And I wrote a story that ruined Hendricks' life. Now he's taking his revenge out on everyone. You know, I just, I feel terrible knowing that something I did played such a big part in all this. Come on. Okay, so getting into the main story and our lead, Voodoo Victims versus a Blast from the Past. Yes, yeah, so we got alliteration and rhyming. <laughs> all right, so we kick off. Clark's having some voodoo-induced nightmares. And it leads to this creepy but pretty well-known magician named Baron Sunday. Yes. And he's, like, just lurking around town being creepy. <laughs> he is. He's very creepy. I didn't get, like, what was going on. Like, when he's in the... You know, like, when he... At first, he appears, of course, you know, like, that that fade over from his nightmare from clark's nightmare yeah. i was like oh that's but that's the a snake weird. eyes yeah exactly but when he shows up in the bus you know it's like what <laughs> what, what's he doing there why is he talking to this guy and <laughs> i actually i i rewound it a couple times because i didn't quite get that he was making that bus driver's scarf disappear because one oh. minute i was watching it yeah i was watching it and there's like a close-up of the scarf and then the next scene he doesn't have it anymore. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what what just happened here? I thought maybe there was like a production error and the, they had it on in the one shot and forgot it in the next. But no, it, it, they purposely did that. Like he's, there's magic, the magical effect that I just didn't get what was going on at first. I was like, oh, okay, I get it now. <laughs> well, that's news to me. I'm glad you brought it up. I did not get that at all. <laughs> well, because he does it again later on with Clark. He, t he takes Clark's uh, handkerchief yeah, from his pocket. Yeah magically so this they only do with this two times i don't they didn't show us uh when he does it with matt young because i guess for this voodoo you know this voodoo thing he does he needs like a personal item so they, we don't know what he got from that that uh ci or ica and ia agent whatever he was we don't know what he took from him personally because we didn't see that part but yeah i was like at first i was like wait what happened there with that scarf let me go back let me go back yeah in the bus driver his name's rod clemens right. he gives him like this vietnam flashback and the dude right. just like bugs out and crashes and has a big heart attack and everything uh, i know it is so weird like they just do not give you much information here at the beginning. This guy's just lurking no. around <laughs> killing people. I know. They just throw you right in, which is kind of neat. Yeah, you know, they don't spell it out for you, so it's a little different than usual. You know, normally we say, oh, yeah, okay, well, he's going to be the bad guy. <laughs> this is where that's going. But this one, they just sort of toss you in there, and you got to try to figure it out yourself. Yeah, and they set him up a bit as this famous magician hypnotist guy and they have this show and jimmy goes up on stage and gets hypnotized and it's kind of awkward <laughs> like for a show that's supposed to entertain like at the beginning everyone's just like oh it's funny he thinks he's in school and stuff but then he's just like but yeah. you're naked and jimmy just starts I know. freaking out i know <laughs> it was not a very uh, yeah for th that was the final illusion of the show it's like that's a weird way to end the show i mean something bigger more dramatic is probably better for a for a show capper that was it was very strange when he hit when he hit his head you know in his mind he hit his head and he started crying like people are kind of like what the heck <laughs> even the audience is like okay clap i guess all right why not <laughs> but he seems like totally unfazed by this because we're gonna learn what his plot is here really right clark has been like experiencing all these visions and stuff of this metal door closing in on him and right. Honestly, I figured it out pretty quickly that it was a vision of him being put in his little space capsule. See, I didn't. And I, I remember this episode, but I don't even remember that as being what he was uh, he was having the nightmare about. I had, couldn't remember. I was like, what is that about? I can't, like, I couldn't recall. Like he said, he steals his handkerchief. And they get in this whole thing where Clark, before he worked at the planet, you know, we know he was like a bit of a world traveler. Right. And he knew this guy from the NIA, Matt Young. 
right. and they go to him for help. And it just so happens that Matt is all tied up in this whole voodoo revenge kick. Right. Because it's got something to do with this gun running thing that was happening in Jamaica. And this is just a big trope. <laughs> voodoo is from Jamaica. That's what popular right. media <laughs> has tried uh -huh. to sell people over the years. Voodoo is from Haiti. Yes. Nathan and I talked about this when we were talking about uh, Predator 2 that also had a oh, Jamaican okay. voodoo gangs in it. Yeah, that's something when I was looking at, well, you'll hear it when we come up in the uh, back issues. Um, there's a little bit of comments about how parts of this is kind of racist. But yeah, some of the things that they, they were saying in there was that voodoo is not really that popular in Jamaica. It's, <laughs> it's from Haiti. And that's what, yeah, that's what I found too. Baron gets into Matt's mind as well and he dies of some sort of shock or like heart attack induced by shock during right. a dog attack and uh i thought this was pretty cool clack <laughs> busts into the main city electricity line or something and uh -huh. yeah <laughs> sort of turns himself into a defibrillator cool use of the powers definitely yeah it's a unique way of using his powers the big giveaway of all this is that this snake symbol appears on their right. chest during this yep. and th you know again clark has this terrifying being closed in vision and lois witnesses this symbol so really we're getting back to superman is being susceptible to magic yeah and this see i like this because this is real magic <laughs> you know this isn't like the uh hen gillette uh, episode where it was just like illusion type magic you know this is actual you know real magic that's going on here so this is cool that he's susceptible to that because in that other episode when he gets hypnotized right away it's like well okay whatever you know i don't think so but this mm -hmm. this is more i can accept this more as a superman fan and it's cool from the aspect that sunday doesn't know who clark is as well right so he can't quite figure out why clark is like so unresponsive to all this voodoo that he's doing to him. oh yeah i thought it was funny that his voodoo doll like he couldn't even stick the pin into the voodoo doll because it's harnessing <laughs> Clark's whatever, his soul or whatever, because the pin itself in the doll would like bend. <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty cool little touch. You know, that comes back later when they're on the plane and Lois picks it up because it's, you know, just fallen on the floor there and he's left it there. Good, right. yeah, just a good little plot point there. But of course, Lois worries that this fear is going to kill Clark. Like, you know, like oh, yeah. we said, you know, it's, it, he's particularly susceptible to magic. So this magic and the fear that it induces, maybe it could actually kill Superman. I mean, if it could get Jimmy a bump on the head, you know, and there was nothing there, why not? And then it goes even further where, because obviously they don't know that Baron's doing all this stuff. They right. turn to him for help. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's, it's just cool how it all kind of interweaved like that. As it turns out, the story that Clark was doing in Jamaica was on this gun runner named John Hendricks. And he was kind of used as a pawn by Matt Young and uh, and that uh, bus driver guy, Clemens, to kind of write a, a, a cover-up story, if you will. Right, exactly. And this guy, John Hendricks, and Baron Sunday are one and the same person. So it... Yeah, I, I don't mind this. It's a pretty good reveal there at the end. Oh, yeah, I didn't expect that, you know, that he was just, uh, you know, first of all, Clark was so young, you know, just starting out, so he didn't know any better, you know. He didn't have those reporter's instincts just yet, so he just accepted, you know, whatever uh, Matt Young said, and this guy, John Hendricks, just got sort of caught up in it and blamed for something he didn't do. And uh, we also get Star back in the episode. <laughs> Right. We haven't seen her for a little while. Yeah, I hadn't expected it because I kind of forgot about her. <laughs> she hasn't been around so long. <laughs> but it makes sense because this is the magic realm, so she, she would know. You know, it's pretty good. She's waving like these like metal bars around or something, and she kind of hones in on that voodoo pin in, well, in Lois's purse. And um, she gives this little bit about like voodoo and dark arts and something called a bokor. And, right. Like, it's... <laughs> It's really nothing to do with anything. Like, it's a little over-explanation, really, because right. we don't need to know about boat calls and stuff. We just need to know that Baron Sunday is the guy doing the voodoo. Right. He's got this, like, loyal sidekick, Ziggy, mm -hmm. who is a very typical, cliched Jamaican. Very much. And this is so weird. We keep running into this guy. <laughs> this is Gary Durden. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nathan and I have seen him on Weekend at Bernie's 2, and... <laughs> 
alien resurrection. So uh, he gets like a trifecta on the Rewatch podcast here, showing up as Ziggy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, he looked familiar, but I don't like I don't remember him from either of those. I, I swore I've seen him in other places, but maybe he just has one of those faces. Where you may know him from is CSI. Mm, maybe. Did you watch CSI? Have, yeah, I've seen. Well, I've seen it here and there because it's, it's always on at the gym for some reason. They always have it playing up on the <laughs> monitors. So I'm sure I maybe that's where it was because I, I I couldn't like place him, but I'm like I know I've seen him before but this is actually pretty cool because he shows up to warn them and of course baron sunday is on to him so he you know works his voodoo on there mm -hmm. and then they have this quick scene where the police show up and of course the body's all covered up they've put a sheet over him and when they look <laughs> under he's like mummy or something yeah as if like maybe baron sunday had brought him back from the dead to be his loyal servant or something i don't know oh that's an interesting yeah i didn't think of that maybe yeah because that doesn't fit any of the other deaths that he's doing in this uh, in this episode. So, yeah, there you go. Maybe he was brought back from the dead. Just to, you know, like a Igor kind of character, you know? Igor was kind of right. deformed and stuff and was the loyal servant to uh, Frankenstein exactly. and stuff. So, I don't know, I kind of like that too. But, you know, of course, Lois and Clark figure out that Young and Clemens had all this gun-running business going on. They know the real story. They go to uh, confront Sunday and possibly even apologize. Like, they, you know, they know the truth now and he's just like, you know, he's obviously ruined this guy's life or at least played a part in ruining this guy's right. life. Right. But he doesn't want to hear any apologies. And he uses his magic against Clark and actually manages to pretty much weaken him. He kicks him out of a plane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and kidnaps Lois, which we've seen a million times. But <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that. But Star happened to like pass on this bit of information about like holding on to something that is like pure and a symbol of love or something like that and mm -hmm. in this case it's lois's wedding band or her engagement ring which i don't know it's works for me it's kind of nice right oh yeah because you know they got that love and you know they've been trying to be together all this time and they're destined you know to be together they're the whole it's the whole soulmate thing so yeah it makes sense and star also said something about like if you know if you really think about the things that you fear if you really try to focus in on it then it probably won't scare you as much anymore yeah like if you you know like when you cast a light on it is what she said you know things that seem scary in the dark you know aren't actually so scary once you get light on it and that's you know that's the whole thing when when he actually holds on to that love and looks at the vision with more depth more perspective he actually realizes the vision is not a scary nightmare thing it's actually they're trying to protect him you know they're trying to send him away putting them into the uh, capsule to send to earth to save him so it's, it's out of love you know once he's able to step back you know, and actually see the whole vision. That So, yeah, I like it. It's a great way to look at that, you know. He doesn't see this as any form of abandonment or anything like that. This was them trying right. to save him. And right. it was an action done out of pure love. So, yeah, I really liked it. And then, of course, with the evil displaced, Superman manages to capture Sunday all as well. The police go to arrest Baron Sunday, but he mm -hmm. has escaped having turned into a snake. Right. <laughs> and it gives you the idea you might see him again, but I don't remember ever seeing him again in, yeah. the, uh, in the series. I will say, he was, uh, he is, Baron Sunday actually is from the Superman comics. I've never read one with him in it, but I looked it up to see. And he is in the comics, and it's pretty close to what we had in the episode, you know, the way he... Uh, acts and everything like that i'm not sure what the whole motivation for him in the comics is but he does want to kill superman in the uh, in the comics that's his whole thing i also looked up the handyman the handyman is not in the comics i could not find any reference to the handyman <laughs> but baron sunday is definitely in there oh there you go yeah yep. that's interesting i can see why they would only use him this once though like this is really just a villain that you just want to use once like he wouldn't, right. he wouldn't work as an overarching, like, Alex Luthor or something like that. Right, right, right. A little touch of this is just fine. <laughs> Let's not go what might, what might have been neat is to see later on, like, they, they don't do this, but it might have been neat to see Baron Sunday hook up with uh, Lex Luthor and together try to take down Superman. Hmm, interesting. You remember in the uh, like when when Lex was trying to have control over that snake that came after him with his with a sabi. Remember sabi <laughs> way back then. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, like that would have been neat to see. I think you know Lex and Baron Sunday together. You know, combining their abilities. I wonder how that would have went. Yeah, that could be interesting. But yeah, he was a he was a pretty good villain, and uh, I kind of liked uh, the story. Yeah, for being for being one of those villain of the week episodes, I actually liked it 
more surprisingly, I liked it more than I thought I would because I, I sort of remembered it and I'm like, oh, it's this one with that guy. But I liked it a lot more than I, I remembered. Yeah, for sure. Well, some bylines for this one. We have uh, Perry <laughs> finally getting set up on a blind date and this really doesn't go anywhere. He just no doesn't <laughs> go on the blind date instead takes jimmy to the magic show yeah and speaking of going to the magic show he's like well you know the kid wanted to see the you know the magic show so bad so i figured i'd bring him he brings him to the very last five minutes of the show it's like oh thanks barry <laughs> you know point, yeah. I, it's like really enjoyed the magic show for the five minutes that i was on stage and embarrassed the hell out of myself <laughs> you know it's all it's all good it's all good yeah i I thought that was when they walk in. It's like they just said it's the last, it's the last five minutes. What the heck? <laughs> Sorry, kid. This is what you get. Missed probably one of the best tricks too with the whole floating head in a box oh, yeah, thing. Exactly. Which was probably real magic too. That was pretty cool. Like yeah. Clark well, yeah, trying to figure out was. how to do it. Yeah, and you can't figure it out because there's it's actual magic. It's not just illusion magic. And then speaking of, uh, when they are going to the magic show, Lois is she really wanted to go to this magic show. She's like. I forget exactly what she said, but this is something that I reactions noted. You know, that she was really into going to the magic show and enjoying the whole show. But if you remember in season one with that Pendulette episode again, she said she hated magic because she could never figure out right. how it's done. You know, <laughs> she hates that. So it's a contradiction to her character from original. Well, maybe Clark has brought out her love of magic. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> we'll go with it. <laughs> we did get this whole thing with Lois's mother really getting involved yeah. in the wedding plans. And yeah. Lois is kind of torn between her mother planning this big extravagant wedding, whereas Clark is like, we agree, right? A nice small little get-together would be good. This seems like something that I've seen before, though, in other shows or movies where like the mother gets overly involved and wants to make it something totally that, you know, the kids might not want. I just, it seems familiar to me, this whole thing. Where do you think this is going? Do you think Lois wants a big flashy wedding and she's kind of just going with whatever Clark says? Or do you think she just doesn't know what to say to her mother about this? I think that's a big part of it. She doesn't know what to say. I don't know. I think she's torn. She likes getting awards, right? So she likes attention. So I could see her you know wanting like a huge wedding where all the eyes are on her and she's getting all this you know all the focus and everything so i could see her wanting that but then of course you've got clark and she wants to consider his feelings as well it's tough to figure out what's going on in her head <laughs> it right. is lois light after all i guess yeah <laughs> I did have just one more point in the bylines before we move on. When they're up in the plane and Baron Sunday is preparing to throw Lois out, how slow are they going? Because you can't just open a plane door in midair like that so <laughs> casually. Right. Like there's a slight breeze that comes through. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah. And I'm like, eh, they do, yeah. we're going for realism on this uh flight here right well he's got his magic powers so he bewitched the plane or something it's just yeah. holding that wind back <laughs> yes but yeah as soon as he opened it it was just like whoosh, and i was like wow that's like it just casually open up a door in midair <laughs> but yeah like i said yeah i like this episode uh i really didn't mm -hmm. think i would you know with the whole voodoo thing but yeah, it was pretty good right i spoke to ivan about the catering as a special favor to me only 150 dollars per person I've already decided to go with the tangerine. I've ordered 20 bowls. But I can't decide. Tent, no tent. I was up all night. Tent. 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 Okay. Tent. Now, doves or Swiss bell ringers? With the bell ringers, it's four months' notice or forget it. <sighs> How many doves do you have to have? At least a thousand. A thousand? I have never seen her have so much fun. <laughs> it's scary. Mm. To life. To life. <laughs> For heaven's sakes, Lois, this is not my wedding. Are you going to participate or not? You're doing fine, Mom. You just keep doing what you do best, and so will we. Let's get into the back issues, shall we? We've reached the new uh, the new year, 96, and 
as I said, I found some stuff <laughs> about this episode. Uh, actually, never on Sunday. I didn't find anything about Home is Where the Herd is from when it first aired, but that was 95. And then we suddenly <laughs> turned, turned the calendar over. We get to 96, the first week here, 96, and I found some stuff in those old forums about this episode, about the Baron episode. So here's what we got. Cool. Um, there was a... Yeah, there was a big thread here uh, where someone was like freaking out about this episode, about how racist it was. You know, this person, I forget who who wrote it. I don't know if it was a woman or a man, I forget. But yeah, they said they were shaking mad and they want an apology from the producers. You know, they don't expect this type of thing from, you know, from Lois and Clark and a nice family type show or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and like it had, a, you know, a bunch of people came to the defense, you know, and they said, well, the actor who played, you know, Baron Sunday, he's a well-respected actor. You know, he wouldn't take a racist part, you know, and sorry, but, you know, these people are from Jamaica and most Jamaicans are black. That's the way it goes. You know, <laughs> if you if you set an episode in Africa, you're going to have a lot of black actors in it, you know. And, yeah. And they, they asked, did you have a problem with the Irish actors when we had that episode, you know, with the leprechauns mm. and the clovers and everything? That was very stereotypical. Did you call racism that? That's what I was yeah. going to say. It's just, it's a stereotype. Just, it is what right. it is. Yeah. So, yeah, they were just all, they were like really mad about it. And they went on for this whole post. And people were just like, well, not really. You know, calm down. In fact, there was one guy who was so funny. Like, he quoted that person's, you know, rant. And every point she made or he made, the guy who reposted it was like, okay, go on. You know, and then they would have another <laughs> part and he'd be like, uh huh. Okay. More. <laughs> like he kept interjecting all these things, and then when he finally got to the bottom of that person's quote, he said, "Okay, prepare yourself for an epic response." You know, and he just like blasted, you know, the the original poster all the way down about why she's wrong about this and that. So it was it was pretty funny uh, to read. Um, <laughs> yeah. Not yeah, you know, not worth going through the whole thing, but yeah, it was it was amusing. But it does beg the question too: Wouldn't it be more racist if they'd cast a white actor in the Jamaican oh, yeah. role? I mean, come on. That's that's what they said. That's what that's what some of the people said as an argument. You know, would you prefer this? You know, <laughs> it's like Jack Black and I still know what you did last summer. Like, come on. Right. Yeah. So now there was uh, someone else who was mad because they said oh, it's all about promoting voodoo, you know, uh, and someone said, well, it's not about that. It's not about promoting it. It's used as part of the story. You might believe that it's, you know, voodoo is evil and everything. And how could they put this on a family show? But people said, no, it's, it's about defeating evil. It's God versus the devil. You know, that's the whole point of this. You know, the, the evil does not win out. So it's not about promoting how good voodoo is. Well, and at the same time, I mean, as much as the characters are stereotypical characters voodoo is a big cliche as well it's not about exactly. dark arts it's just about ooh, they use voodoo and voodoo is evil exactly okay so also uh there was someone who posted uh, about this and i noticed this change too they're tired of the huggy kissy endings you know how the each episode is ending with them hugging and kissing mm -hmm. now whereas before they always end with like a punchline and people going ha 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 you know like a funny joke to end the, the whole episode they, they miss that they miss the punchline endings yeah. uh, someone said and they also said the wedding story line you know especially in this episode the baron sunday episode is really quick like it's very rushed you know like they, they suddenly go from just being engaged to you know having a planner and planning all these lavish things it's like it just it seems a little soon you know like they could take their time planning out a wedding you know in real life obviously this is a tv show but still they felt it was like a little rushed well it does seem that they're aiming to get the wedding done before the end of this season i mean that's that's yeah. kind of how i'm feeling like exactly. by the end of the season lois and clark will be husband and wife mm. and like i said I don't, I don't remember if that is the case but yeah it seems yeah. to me like that's where it's heading so exactly and then finally there was an error about superman's birthday because traditionally in the comics his birthday is february 29th and in this episode they said it was february 28th of course february 29th is like a leap day you know mm -hmm. so every four years is what dc comics has established as his birthday and then uh, they just made it for whatever reason they said the 28th i know a lot of people who have leap year birthdays just celebrate on the 28th so maybe that's you know what they were going for with that or they it means they can technically not lie about their age but <laughs> you know when you turn 40 you're actually turning 10 right exactly <laughs> and now like when they went back in time in the tempest episode did they establish that when clark landed in that ship that that was february because i don't think they said no i don't I don't think they ever really established an exact day. Because, well, no, wait, they, they must have established a day because it was the great Smallville bank robbery 
day. Remember? Right. Yeah. Was there? Let me see. Let me uh, take a quick look here. <laughs> Great Small Hill robbery. Because if that's not on the same day, then it means that Martha and Jonathan just randomly pick some arbitrary day and said, "Yep, that's his right." <laughs> okay. Oh, I just found it. All right. And you know where I found it? It's on uh, RedBoots.net, which nice. is uh, Zume's uh, site. So see, she comes to the uh, rescue. All these years later. Oh, thank you, Zoomway. We love you. So on here is a uh, description of, I guess, uh, yeah, Lois and Clark's. It's under Lois and Clark's relationship on her site here. And there's a screenshot of it from when Clark types it in into the computer. <laughs> Remember we complained about that? Or you complained about that? Yeah, he just pauses the computer and it comes up Smallville, USA. No, no Smallville, Kansas, just Smallville, USA. And underneath it, it says May 17th. 1966 hmm. so they have may 17th that's when his parents found him so there you go we got two errors really they said february 28th and he was actually found on may 17th <laughs> arbitrary but uh yeah yep. maybe they'll flesh that out in some future episode yeah <laughs> <laughs> probably, sure yeah probably not <laughs> All right, well, our next issue, we will be discussing the dad who came in from the cold and Tempest Anyone. Hmm? I wonder what that's so about. I think we can agree. Yeah, Tempest Anyone is probably about the return of Lex Luthor, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's obvious Tempest is coming back. What I really yes. want to know, are we getting back H.G. Wells? Oh, yeah. I. You know what? All right. I mean, I think we are. From what I remember, this is actually the Tempest storyline that I've been waiting for, I think, but I'm not positive that it's actually more than one episode that this takes place over. If I remember correctly, but I, I could be wrong, I just, I seem to think that it was a bigger storyline, more than one episode long. So we'll see when we get to it. Yeah, I don't know. I, but I remember really liking it. Awesome. Yeah, well, we, you know, I mentioned Weekend at Bernie's 2 just before because of Gary Nerdin, but mm. I would love it if we got Terry Kaiser back in the issue. Well, oh, yeah. Part, because I love that character. I thought it was great. From what I remember, Tempest Anyone is going to be a Sliders-type storyline hmm. concerning alternate dimensions. Ah, so like sort of... Mm -hmm playing on that time travel thing but maybe going yes. a bit back to the future too on it right exactly cool so i'm i'm very excited because i haven't seen those episodes in forever well i haven't seen any of these in forever but i remember really enjoying that whole storyline awesome now the dad who came in from the cold i believe this is the episode that i was referencing when i thought we were talking when we did a target jimmy olsen was it oh, and i said Jimmy's it was about his dad. father coming back right. yeah i think this is the one I think I'm hoping this is the one. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the one where his dad comes into the picture. It'd be so great we'll if this was out. like a running gag where just every week you're like, I think this is the one about Jimmy's dad. And then the episode never exactly. comes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Cool. Whatever the case may be, Jimmy's dad or Lex Luthor, we will find out next week because that's it for this issue of the Rewatch Podcast. Keep up with listener interaction by liking our Facebook page at facebook.com slash rewatch podcast or facebook.com slash Lois and Clark Rewatch and follow the show on Twitter at Rewatch Pod. Don't forget you can visit our webpage at rewatchpodcast.podomatic.com which has links to some of our favorite sites there such as the aforementioned zoomway.net, folc.wiki.com, the superman homepage.com plus the links to our archive of film rewatch episodes and as always you can write us an email or record a voice message and send it to the rewatch podcast at gmail.com and also if you've enjoyed the show please consider giving us a rate and review on itunes and you can help support us by heading over to patreon.com slash the rewatch podcast and make a monthly contribution as little as a dollar and help us keep the lights on around here. Very helpful. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we're also up on YouTube, so search Rewatch Podcast and subscribe today. You can get every single episode we've ever done, which I think is just a bit over 100 episodes now. Oh, Between wow, nice. Sliders, Lois and Clark, and all the film rewatches, but just a bit over the 100 mark right. now. So, yes, plenty of nice. listening pleasure there. Oh, yes. <laughs> all right. Well, as always, thank you for joining me, Tom. Yep. And I would just say, until next time, two spoonfuls of this and prepared to be over. Uh, well, we gotta fly. The Rewatch Podcast is not associated with Warner Brothers Television, ABC, Gangbuster Films Incorporated, or Round Delay Productions. Don't believe everything you see on TV. The use of any and all copyrighted material is only for parody, news analysis, critique, or educational purposes as provided in United States Code Title 17, a.k.a. Fair Use. Let's get legal on this.
Music provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Great shades of Elvis. Copyright 2016, The Rewatch Podcast. Where are your beepers? We'll be in touch. Hi, Rewatch Podcast listeners. I'm Corey. I'm Tom. And I'm Nathan. First off, let me say that we have all had a blast doing the Rewatch Podcast. Every week, we put out another episode for free for you. And although we enjoy these discussions with each other, we truly do this for you guys out there in podcast land. That's right, Corey. But we are here today to tell you about Patreon. Every week, there are costs involved in podcasting about film and television, including hosting and bandwidth charges, our own personal internet usage, and film or show rentals and purchases. So, we're asking you to become a Patreon supporter. If you can afford as little as $1 to throw our way per month, it would really help us keep the lights on. And if you want to send $100 our way every month, we wouldn't turn that down either. But it's your choice, and we appreciate the support you bring. As always, we strive to bring you the best quality shows we can create and we hope that you enjoy them so head on over to patreon.com slash rewatch podcast to become one of our patrons and show your support for the rewatch podcast and if we get enough patrons we may even be able to produce exclusive content just for the supporters in the form of simply getting episodes before the main feed release or even bonus film discussion episodes as a thank you for your support the website again is patreon.com slash rewatch podcast thanks everyone